Morning, everyone. Let's pray as we approach God's word together. Loving Heavenly Father, we praise you for your word to us this morning. We pray that you would teach us, that you would work in us, you would open our eyes to see wonderful things in your word. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I wonder how you're feeling about church at the moment, particularly as we come out of lockdown. Maybe you're excited, you know, as we ease out of lockdown, um, we just can't wait to get serving, can't wait to, for things to get back to the way things were. You know, Charlotte and May give notices about services and Sunday school opening up, and you're like, yes, I can't wait, sign me up. If that's you, then wonderful, that's great, praise God. But maybe you're feeling a bit more hesitant about church. As we open up, you're thinking, how's this going to work? How are we going to do this? We're in a, we find ourselves um, in a new building. Things are not as they were. Perhaps we've settled into new routines of doing things, particularly on a Sunday, doing, things, uh, doing church from home, which is a lot more comfortable in many ways. Um, maybe over the last year, because we haven't had the encouragement of meeting physically together very much, we've kind of drifted spiritually and other Pressures and stresses that have come into our life over the last year have, have meant that sort of church priorities have kind of dwindled away. And if we're honest, we're thinking a little bit, I don't know how I'm going to ever get the time back to serve at church in the way that I used to pre-COVID. So if any of that resonates for you, and I expect that's for quite a few of us, then this book of Haggai is really going to minister to us over the next three weeks. Verse 1 helps us to know exactly the date and therefore the situation that God's people were facing at the time, back in the Old Testament, before Jesus came. God had graciously allowed a remnant of his people to return to their homeland, to Israel, to Jerusalem, to restart building the temple of God. And they'd made a promising start. Only two years after they'd come back out of exile in Babylon, they'd laid the foundation of the temple. All good. But then God's people slowly started focusing on themselves, on their own lives, on their own houses rather than God's house. And 14 years later, well, the temple was still in ruins. So God raises up the prophet Haggai, To challenge the people about this, just look at verses 2 and 3. Verse 2, thus says the Lord of hosts, this people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. Then the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. Is it a time for for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies in ruins? The people were saying, the time has not yet come to rebuild the temple. You know, this reminds me so much of Sir Humphrey Appleby. I don't know if you're familiar with the 80s political comedy. Um, He was a civil servant, and the way he used to get around not having to do any of the new policies of the minister that he was working for would would never be to disagree with the minister's policy. Oh, no, he'd be fully on board, agree completely that it's important. But he would just say, it's just that now's not the right time, minister. Of course I agree, it's a priority, minister. But it's just not the right time. It's classic avoidance tactics. But in response, God asks the most piercing question. Is it a time for you to dwell in panelled houses while this house, my temple, lies in ruins? In their day, uh, interior panelling like this was usually uh, of cedar wood and would only be found on the most sort of plush and luxurious and decadently decorated of homes and buildings. You know, we're talking pharaoh and ball as a minimum standard, and you can just forget Ikea. Do you see? God is challenging his people here. He's saying, look at your homes. No expense spared. Now look at my temple. It lies in ruins. The word there means desolate wasteland. Don't you see something fundamentally wrong with this picture? 
You see, God knew the real reason why his people were neglecting the temple of God. They'd become inward-looking and self-serving. They were more interesting more interested in building up their own house than God's house, more interested in building up their own kingdoms rather than God's kingdom. And they were to take this matter very seriously because of who was speaking these words. Not just Haggai, couldn't just write him off as a loony. No, because these were the words of none other than the Lord of hosts. Did you notice just five times... God refers to himself as the Lord of hosts in chapter 1 alone. And that means the Lord of armies. It's a a pertinent reminder to Israel that the one speaking is the one who, yes, rescued them out of Egypt, out of slavery all those years ago. But he's also the God who punished them for their sin and for their rebellion, who disciplined his people and sent them away out of the promised land into exile for 70 years. You know, they were not to take these words lightly, and neither should we. You know, I found this all very personally challenging um, to ask myself the question, whose house am I living for right now? I'm, am I living for God's house, or am I living for my own house? What matters to me more right now, my own personal comfort or the building of God's church for his glory, the salvation of lost souls. Now, this isn't saying, of course, that it's wrong for a Christian to have a nice house and well-decorated, but it is calling into question, what, are, what is our priority at this time? So we turn to our key verse, which contains the main idea for us today and the main application. That's verse 8. God says to his people, go up to the hills and bring the wood and build the house that I may take pleasure in it and that I may be glorified, says the Lord. The house there is referring, of course, to the temple of God, not just any old building project, but the temple had a unique gospel significance. You see, in the Old Testament, the the, the temple symbolized uh, something truly amazing. Well, two things. Firstly, the presence of God with his people, dwelling with his people. And secondly, the forgiveness of God through its sacrificial system. This is the, the way that people could come back into relationship with God, all pictured there in the temple. And of course, that temple symbolism is fulfilled in the church today as, as we point to Jesus Christ, the one who fulfills Uh, Those things that the temple always pointed to. Jesus Christ is the one who is is the very presence of God in human form. Jesus Christ is the one who brings forgiveness of sins through his sacrifice on the cross, which fulfilled all the Old Testament sacrifices. Jesus is the way that we can come back into relationship with God as we trust in his death on the cross for us. So this command applies to us. While we're not commanded to rebuild a physical temple, we are commanded to build the church of God. Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations. We're to build by making disciple makers. And the way that we build the church today is proclaiming the message of God, the good news of God, the gospel, to everyone and anyone. See, that's how the church is built today, as people hear and respond to the good news of Jesus. As people respond, it's like another brick is being laid on the temple. And just notice how emphatic this command is in verse 8. Not just one, but three strong commands. Go up to the hills, bring the wood, and build the house. You know, it really reminds me of... Uh, like an exasperated parent who, in desperately trying to get their kids to school one morning, issues kind of step-by-step commands to uh, their children. Sort of, you know, um, find your shoes, put them on, and get in the car. It's really, really strong. It's really emphatic. God means business here. Go, bring, and build. And that's why the title of this talk is Get Building. 
Now, we mustn't misunderstand this to make us think, oh, well, God needed his people, Israel, to do him a favor back in the Old Testament. It's important, really important to, to say that God doesn't need his people to build him a temple. God is the eternal creator God, the one who is totally self-sufficient and owns everything. He doesn't need anyone's help. No, rather, building the temple showed that his people had a relationship with him. It was to be the greatest privilege that any people in the world could have. To show that God was in your midst. No other nation had that. And to have this relationship with with God was to be the, the source of their joy. And the same is true for us. You know, God doesn't need us. We need him always. But it does show that we get to take part in what God is doing in the world. The building of his church for his eternal glory and our eternal joy. You know, I really do believe that this is a word in season for us. Um, You'll know that we've undergone some huge changes as a church. We find ourselves now in the position where we're having to rebuild the in-person ministry uh, in a new building, uh, in, a, in, a, in a different setting with ever-changing restrictions. And I know this isn't going to be easy for us. We're all going to need to reprioritize the building of the church. We're going to need to roll up our sleeves and embrace the pain of change. We're all going to need to pitch in to get things back up and running. We're all going to need to think in new ways and serve in new ways and be patient in new ways. You know, it's not going to be the well-oiled machine that it was before as we as we try things, as as they don't work, as we as we adapt and as we changed. And most importantly of all, we, we need to all believe that building back is what God wants us to do. It's what he commands us to do here, to get building. And in this passage, we see four huge reasons why we should get building. The first is the glory of God. Just look at the second half of verse 8. God says, The reason they should build the temple is that I may take pleasure in it, says the Lord, and that I may be glorified. You see, the building of the church today is what glorifies God the most. It's what gives him the greatest pleasure. Ephesians uh, chapter 3 verse 10 says, so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. You see the church is what displays the glory of God to the universe. It displays his grace to sinners, his power to save, his all-conquering love, his justice and his righteousness. It struck me, the trouble is with that, is that we don't really believe that living for God's glory is really going to make us happy. We, we believe the world's lie that if we live for God's glory and not our own, then we're going to miss out in life. We're, it's going to make us miserable. And so even the, with the best will in the world, we kind of want to go half and half with God. But no, we need to realize and believe that living for God's glory is the only way to true and lasting happiness, both in this life and the life to come. Because God's glory will one day be experienced and enjoyed by his people forever in heaven and the new creation. It will be the source of our eternal joy. There is no wiser thing to do with our lives than live for God's glory and the building of his church. You know, I heard of a man once who um, was a, a city high flyer, and uh, he became a Christian uh, well into his 60s. And his reflection as he looked back on his life as he was talking to this local pastor uh, was that he'd wasted his life. He wished he'd become a Christian much early in life. Yes, he'd built up a multi million pound uh, company in the city. But it felt like a wasted time when he could have been living for Jesus and building his church, doing something that really mattered with eternal 
significance. So that's the first reason we should build the church, because we know that it displays God's glory, and that will be the source of our eternal joy. But secondly, the discipline of God. Just have a look at verses 5 and 6. Now, therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much and harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages does so to put them into a bag with holes. God says, consider your ways. In fact, this command is emphasized because it's repeated again in verse 7. Consider your ways. It means, it means to, to stop and give careful thought to how you're living your life. It literally means set your heart on your ways. Examine your hearts. God is saying to his people, just stop and think about how neglecting the temple of God is working for you. Am I blessing you as you do that? Well, no, he's not. And you could ask, well, why, why would he bless his people as they ignore the rebuilding of the temple? Why would he subsidize their neglect? Why would he encourage their selfishness and reward their laziness to their own harm? You know, it's such a tragic picture of a wasted life, isn't it? It's such powerful uh, images. Imagine eating but always being hungry. Imagine drinking but always being thirsty. Imagine um, you know, putting on layers of clothes but never being warm. Imagine slogging away uh, to earn wages only to put them into a bag that has holes and it just falls out. That's how often life feels, doesn't it? Now is this because, is God doing this because he, he's spiteful and kind of just enjoys frustrating his people? Well, no, of course not. The, reason, the real reason is confirmed for us again in verse, verse 9, that final sentence. Just look down. He says, it's because of my house that lies in ruins, while each of you busies himself with his own house. You know, the original word, uh, word busies there, in the original, has the idea of running around. So God's people were running around, a bit like headless chickens, trying to make ends meet, neglecting the temple, focusing on themselves. And all the while, not realizing that it was God's loving discipline to teach his people the error of their ways. Now, this is God's economy. When we put him first, he supplies all we need to live on and to give on. Whereas if we give him the scraps of our lives, well, God doesn't honor that. He takes away our money and time and energy with a loving discipline that teaches us that we should be, as his people, putting him first, where he belongs to be. You know, maybe this is a bit close to the bone for some of us this morning. Maybe we need to hear God's call to consider our ways. Maybe we just need to stop and take stock of our lives at this moment. You know, ask ourselves, why is it life just gets busier and busier and crazier and crazier? I never seem to have enough time or money or energy left over for God. Is it because I'm actually, in some ways, neglecting his church, the building of his church? Am I giving God the scraps of my life rather than the first fruits? Do I need to believe Jesus' words to seek first the kingdom of, of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. Is God graciously and lovingly teaching us to consider our ways? And that's the second reason we should get building. Not only because of God's glory, but because of God's discipline. And now the third reason, the fear of God. Just look at verse 12. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet as the Lord their God had sent him. And the people feared the Lord. Strikes me that this is the perfect response to God's word, isn't it? 
as such a model for us. Three things. Firstly, they responded fearfully out of a right fear of God. That's not an awful fear, but a fearful awe that made them obedient to his word. Not only did they respond fearfully, but they responded corporately. Did you notice? Not just the leaders, not just a few keen enthusiasts, but everyone. As a whole church, as one body, they responded. Not only fearfully, but immediately. We're told in verse 15 that within a month, they'd completely changed their lives. They completely reordered their priorities. And that might sound like a long time, but actually, just think about changing your entire course of your life by next month. That's a rapid, immediate change. Their mindset had changed. It affected their diaries, what went in, what didn't go in. It affected their bank balances. It affected their giving. No more procrastination. No more, I would, but it's just not the right time, minister. They all responded immediately. And what a model for us. Let's be praying that Lionstown would always be a church that responds to God's word fearfully corporately and immediately. So we build because of the glory of God, the discipline, the fear of God, but finally the blessing of God. This is truly wonderful. See, as a result of God's people responding in this way, the Lord made the most incredible promise to them. Firstly, his presence with them. Look at verse 13. Then Haggai, the messenger of the Lord, spoke to the people with the Lord's message. I am with you, declares the Lord. This reminds me so much of the Great Commission, you know, at the end of Matthew's Gospel, where Jesus tells us to make disciple makers. And as we do that, as we build his church, Jesus says, I will be with you to the end of the age. We build his church because that's how we experience the presence of Jesus in our lives. Not only that, but we experience his power and his encouragement. Did you notice in verse 14 that God will stir us up to to work and keep working on building his church. Do you want to experience the presence and the power of God in your life? Then get building because of the blessing of God. But maybe you can't get building because you're not yet on the team. You see, it may well be that you're not yet a Christian. You've been hearing about Jesus and you know it's true but you haven't yet responded. You've been thinking, I know it's true, but now's just not the right time to become a Christian, to give my life to Jesus and the building of his church. I've got other priorities to sort out right now. Well, God says now is exactly the right time. Jesus said, um, Paul said, now is the favorable, favorable time. Now is the day of salvation. Today is the day to turn to Jesus. So come to him. The one that the temple always pointed to all along. The one who brings us God's presence into our lives. The one who brings forgiveness of our sins through his death on the cross. Trust in him and know the joy and comfort of the gospel. Join with us as we build the church of God for his glory and our eternal joy. So in summary, we've seen four huge reasons why we need to get building this morning. Get building because of the glory of God, which will one day be our inheritance and our eternal joy. It's not something we have to do, it's something we get to do. Get building because of the discipline of God. We need to consider our ways. Is God teaching us that it's a time for re-evaluation of our priorities? Get building because of the fear of God, where to respond obediently, corporately and immediately to God's call and get building because of the blessing of God, God's own dear presence and power as we engage in the most wonderful of privileges it is possible to have in this life, the building of the church of Jesus Christ for the glory of God. My friends, the task before us is great, but it is noble. So let's pray and let's get building. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for your word to us today. We pray that you would take it deep into our hearts. 
and that we would desire to get building for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.